G'day, welcome back to the channel. No gaudy shower curtains in the background for you today. No, it's a treat. Just a bland, boring background. And I, I have to apologize, another talking head video because, because we've had the lockdown. Lockdown's finished, but now there was a manned aviation crash at the Tokra airfield yesterday. Um, one of the locals uh, taking off in a crosswind, lost control, wiped the wing off his Jodel D11, an aircraft that's featured on this channel a number of times. And uh, fortunately, no major injuries. I think the guy's apparently in a neck brace and uh, the passenger was okay, so a small relief there. But it does go to show that no matter what we do, manned aviation is always going to be more dangerous than unmanned aviation. Regulators, they don't want to acknowledge that, but it is a fact, it's a reality. There is no doubt about that. No one has ever died as a result of the recreational use of a multi-rotor drone. But people die every day in manned aviation accidents around the world. These things need to be remembered by regulators who constantly work to remove our freedoms, our rights and our privileges in order apparently, apparently to make the world safer. Even though, as I say, nobody's died. But I want to address some of the comments that came up on the last video I did. Uh, there was a slide in that video and I said that I had been told that this was part of an FAA presentation. Now I didn't say this was part of an FAA presentation, I said I had been told. I have a background in journalism that goes back quite a few decades, so I am always very careful to make the point that if something has been passed on to me and I don't have independent verification of that, I will let you know that this is simply what I was told. I will not present it as a fact, and I did not do that in that video because people have come and said, oh, it wasn't from the FAA at all, it was from an independent lobby group, commercial drone lobby group, you know, you're, you're misleading people, you're just inciting, you know, fear and uncertainty in order to get clicks and views. And I, I would say that these people who, who make those claims need to rethink what they're saying. Um, we looked, if it was from a third party, well it was, apparently it was from a third party, the Enos group, third party, produced this slide. They wouldn't have produced it just to show people and do nothing with it. Obviously it's going to be part of a representation to the regulator. That's their view of where future regulation should be headed. Now that's what that's their view, that we should be flying FPV only in grassy fields or only as part of a commercial operation. We shouldn't be allowed to fly FPV in bandos um, without having a part 107, that sort of thing. This was their view of the future and why should we consider that to be important? Well, because they're part of the commercial drone industry. And if we look at the way things are at the moment, we have recreational model flyers and drone flyers engage in over 80%, over 80% of all the flying activity of unmanned aerial vehicles in the national airspace. Over 80%, that's the huge majority of all that flying is us, right? But if we look at the composition of the, the boards, the groups, the committees, the advisory bodies that the regulators call on when they're making new rules, it's 99% drone industry and a tiny 1% or 2% the hobby. So we do all, we have all the activity, we're the experts, we're doing this every day, but the people who get to have the biggest hand in making regulation is the industry, the commercial drone operators. They get to say we don't. And we can see that so clearly if we look at the results of the uh, remote ID NPRM. And they put, the FAA put out a proposal, we're gonna require you to have network remote ID and you'll have to get clearance from a UTM and that sort of stuff. And there were 53,000 submissions by Hobbyists, mainly hobbyists like ourselves, who said, no, 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 we don't want to be into this. It's stupid. And what have we got? Well, we've got remote ID, whether we want it or not. And you might say, I know some people have been saying, oh, but hey, we won a victory because they're not giving network remote ID. It's only broadcast. What a victory. What a score for us. Our submissions all paid off. The system works. To which I would say, you people are so naive. So naive. Because if you look at the FAA's response to all those submissions, they did a response document. And do a search, just do a search for at this time, that, that phrase, at this time. Their response is very clearly, we are not going to require network remote ID at this time. And people might think, well, that's good because we convinced them that it would be a bad idea. No, 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 we didn't. As a group, we didn't. They, they largely ignored the 53,000 submissions. The only submissions that had a real effect on the shape of remote ID at the moment, as it's going to be implemented, were from the technology partners who said, we can't deliver. We can't give you network remote ID because we don't have ubiquitous network coverage. We don't have the infrastructure to deliver that kind of connectivity in the way that you will need it to run this network remote ID system at this time. 
So the FAA had no option but to back down to a broadcast remote ID because they just cannot demand something that cannot be delivered. That's why we have broadcast remote ID. Not because we said we didn't want network, it's because it just they can't deliver it. So those submissions, you might have think you've won a victory. No, people, look, read closely what the FAA has said. They made it very clear that as soon, as soon as the technology exists to allow network remote ID, that's exactly what they'll be demanding. So um, we, we have the situation where we are not listened to, despite the overwhelming number of submissions. Now, fortunately, we have people like Race Day Quads, um, Tyler Brennan, who has invested a lot of time, effort and money in bringing a legal action to bear to try and get this remote ID thing thrown out because obviously the hobby doesn't want it. Now it seems strange to me that with the AMA and with all these other groups who purport to represent the hobby, it takes an individual and his business to make the submission, to actually get off their bums and do the hard slog and to actually do something, not just complain about it, but to actually do something. That is fantastic. Now if you haven't seen what they're doing, you haven't contributed, go and have a look and if you think it's worthwhile, feel free to throw, throw a few dollars at them because it is not a cheap option. John, uh, Jonathan Ruprecht is a really expensive lawyer. He costs a fortune, you have to pay his bills. He likes to keep his BMW polished twice a day. Just kidding, Jonathan. But we really do need to acknowledge that Tyler is doing a fantastic job there and support him. I'm gonna do a video on, his, on, on what he's doing uh, in, a, in a few days. But at the moment, I fully support him. I really hope he prevails but I'm deeply worried that he won't. And I'll, do, I'll tell you why in a, in a, in a video that follows. Um, but that's enough of that. Just, but what I want to tell you is um, we don't count for beans when it comes to making regulations. We really don't. So that slide, even though it came from a third party, is going to have far more influence in the shape of regulations than anything we say or do in the way we've been doing it to date. So we have to change our strategies. Our strategies have been wholly reactive. We have waited for an NPRM and then we've gone, oh, oh, we must react, Look, write a submission, send it in, doesn't do anything. Um, being reactive, it means you're always on the back foot. You're never leading the thing, you're never in control, you're always one step behind the regulator, you're always being dragged along and having to try and fight off things you don't want. That's not the way to win a war. You don't win a war from, from being on the back foot. You must be proactive, you must be forward, you must be initiating things, not just waiting for things to happen and complaining about them. So I'm going to explain, hopefully in this video, just one of the strategies that I'm working on to help us recover our lost freedoms and to, to enable us to protect the freedoms that we still have. But before we go there, I just want to also point out that the people who are saying, I'm overstating things, it's not as bad as it looks, you know, where the hobby isn't in real danger, there's a few rules, who cares, you know, you don't, be a, don't be a doom and gloom merchant. Well, um, I would have to say, yes, we should be worried. Um, and people, I'm old, I'm old, I'm sorry, it's, unfortunately I'm old, and old age doesn't bring much in the way of benefits, but it does bring one benefit, and that's experience. Experience. I've got 68 years of life experience to draw on, and I look back into history, and I see, I've seen this kind of thing happen before. It's thin end of the wedge, I've mentioned this thin end of the wedge. When a regulator wants to introduce changes that will not be popular. They don't just dump them all in people's laps and say, there you go, the rules have changed, because that creates massive outrage. Everyone goes, no, 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 and they lobby their politicians and things, and, and they really do get seriously angry. But if you want to make that easier, you just drip feed out the changes, because someone's sitting there and the regulations change today, and you look at it and go, oh, oh that's not very good, but it's, it's not too bad. It's, not, it's just only a small change. I can live with that. And then tomorrow, Oh, another change. Hmm, okay. Oh, yeah, that, that's not too bad. Because from day to day, the changes are very small and incremental, and they go unchallenged and sometimes even unnoticed, right? That's the, the thin end of the wedge. You just keep doing it. It's like the, another analogy is you put a, a pot in a, a frog in a pot of cold water, stick it on a stove, and just raise the temperature very gradually. By the time the frog realizes he's being boiled alive, he can't jump out because he's nearly dead. That's what they're doing to us. They're just thin end of the wedge, dripping the stuff out. And I said, I mean, because people say, you're just, you're overreacting. But I, I say, well, my track record speaks for itself. Way back when we still had the protection in the USA of Section 336, I warned that these changes, the, the FAA came out and said, you've got to register. And fortunately, um, a guy called John Taylor fought that because the FAA had no authority to regulate the hobby in that way. And that was overturned. But as I'll say in a future video, pointing out in a future video, you can't beat the man that makes the rules because the government just changed the rules. They said, well, okay, we'll give the FAA the authority to regulate you and we'll revoke 336 and we'll have a re new reauthorization act and now they can make you register. So there, so much for your victory in the courts. 
So I said way back then, whoa, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. I watched the AMA sleep through meetings discussing the Reauthorization Act and things, and I thought, oh God, no one's, no one's looking out for the hobby. What's going on? And sure enough, we, we look at it, and if you go back five years to two, early 2018 or something, or whatever that is, go back, you know, before Section 336 was revoked, and look at the freedoms that the hobby had in the USA that they've since lost. Um, you could fly to any altitude you wanted. There was no 400 foot limit. There was no regulation that said you may not fly the higher than 400 feet. Nothing. There was no regulation that said you can't fly FPV beyond visual line of sight. Nothing. There was no regulation that said if you're flying FPV, you've got to have a visual observer standing by and looking out for planes. Nothing. Those were all freedoms that were had and enjoyed by the hobby. And nobody died. Nobody died. No major property damage. It, it's, it's not like this was causing a whole lot of um, risk to the wider community or the people that enjoyed the hobby. There was, the risks were so small that there were no incidents involving these activities. But, but the FAA came along and said, well, well revoke 336. Now, you, now immediately we're going to bring in rules that say you can't fly over 400 feet, you can't fly BV loss, you can't fly FPV without a visual observer, and you must register and you must sit an online test, and you must fit a broadcast remote ID device to your drone. And these have all been rolled out incrementally. So yeah, say from day to day, not much change, not much change. But when you look back at it, if you took someone who was flying in 2015 and popped them right here immediately into today and they looked at the regulations, they go, what the hell? What's going on? Why do I have to sign an offenders list just because I have a drone that weighs more than eight ounces? Why? And, and why can't I fly higher than 400 feet? Why can't I fly beyond visual line of sight? Why do I have to have an observer? Why do I need to put a, a broadcast remote ID device on my drone soon at my cost and to no benefit to me? What is going on? But because it's been incremental, nobody really has noticed. So those people who say I'm overstating things, no, I'm not. I, I'm looking at the bigger picture, and I've seen this happen so many times before in so many different areas that this, this gradual implementation of rules that would never otherwise get allowed sneaks in, and before you know it, before you know it, you've lost your freedoms, you've lost your rights, you've lost your privileges to incremental regulatory creep. It's, it's regulatory overreach, and it's done so slowly and incrementally that people, are, they don't notice until it is too late. Like the frog in the saucepan, you don't notice until it's way too late. And that's the situation that we're facing at the moment. So I refute claims that I'm overstating things because I honestly believe in the, in the wholeness of my heart that within five years, we will have network remote ID. You will not be able to arm your drone until you've paid your money to take off and cleared it with the UTM. You will only be able to fly without a lot of restrictions in grassy fields in the middle of nowhere. That's the way the world is headed. And if you can't see that, I'm sorry, maybe I am wrong, maybe I'm just a conspiracy nut. Come back in five years and look at this video and see how wrong I was. I don't think I'll be too wrong, but I could be wrong. I always admit, I'm, anyone can be wrong and I am especially can be wrong. But anyway, let's look, I've mentioned a strategy for dealing with these problems. We need to take the fight to the regulator. And when I was devising strategies, I, the first thing you do when you're, when you're waging a war and you're trying to develop strategies to win, is you look for your weaknesses. Because you, the, your enemy will use your weaknesses against you as you should use their weaknesses against them. So the first thing I did was look, what, are, what is the weakness of this hobby? What is, as, as a group, what is our weakness? And our weakness is that we are just not unified. We are just a crowd of individuals. And that is very, very disempowering. A good, a good comparison is look at gun owners in the USA. Look at the NRA. Now there are millions of gun owners who joined the NRA. And they move in concert. They pull in the same direction. They all operate together through the NRA. They have tremendous political clout. They can, they can bully the, the politicians into getting their way and, and not passing ridiculous regulations a lot of the time. They have a unified might. It's, it's almost the unstoppable force, right? Now compare that to our hobby. We have just a whole lot of individuals all milling around, walking in different directions. There is no, there's no movement to that. It's just noise. It's just bubbling heads in a sea of people. There's, there's no movement. There's no power involved in that because we cancel each other out. We're just bobbing around. We're not prepared to get together and form a unified group to go out there and lobby on behalf of the hobby. I've tried to do this. The International Model Aviation Safety League was an attempt to bring the world's model flyers together in a single voice. It failed. Just over a thousand members. Didn't work. And other groups, other attempts to do this have failed equally. We're just not people who want to group together for our own best interest. We are just individuals. We just want to enjoy the hobby. We want to share the interest, but we're not prepared to get off our bums and act as a unified force. That's our biggest weakness. And that's being exploited immensely because 
Divide and conquer is a fantastic way to defeat your enemy. We need to be aware of that weakness and work around it. Come up with strategies that mitigate that weakness. And I think I've been doing some pretty hard thinking in that area, and I've come up with a number of strategies. I've got three strategies we can use. I'm going to talk about the first one today. The second one is civil disobedience. I'll cover that in a separate video because it's something that needs an entire video to itself. But the first one is we will do the regulators' job for them. Yep, we're going to do the job they did not do. Now, in order for regulations to be a fair balance of freedoms, rights, privileges, and responsibilities, you've got to be able to identify what the risks are and create rules that are proportionate to those risks, to manage the risks. And to, to identify what the risks are and, and to quantify them so you know how strong the regulation has to be, you've got to do a risk assessment. That's, that's common. This is in every aspect of, of industry and of life. Risk assessments are a crucial part. And so you would think that the regulators would have done this and they would have done a risk assessment, then developed a set of rules which were designed to adequately manage the risks that are identified and quantified. The reality is a lot different. If you go to the CAA, if you go to CASA, if you go to Transport Canada, if you go to the FAA and say, can we please have a copy of the risk assessment you used to formulate your rules controlling drones and model aircraft, they will say, we haven't got one. We didn't do one. There's no such document. Because I know because I've asked. So how can you produce a set of rules that are going to be an effective balance of freedoms, rights and privileges against responsibilities if you haven't identified what the real problems are and how big those problems are? You, you can't. So what we end up with is a rule set which is not a good match. It, it takes away too many freedoms, which means they're not going to get the compliance they want. Because if, if someone looks at a rule and says, this is totally unreasonable, totally unfair, there's no point for this rule, people are unlikely to follow that rule. So the rule becomes ineffective. So the, the regulators might say, oh, we've regulated this, we've got a really tough rule to stop people from flying FPV without a visual observer, that's a good rule. If someone is flying their model under the trees in a remote area, um, FPV, they're going to look at that rule and go, yes, I don't need an observer. There's no point in having an observer. There's no safety value to that. I'm going to ignore that rule. So immediately the rule becomes worthless. It's no longer being complied with. It's not a good rule because they can, people can ignore that rule in total safety on occasions. And that's not a good thing. You need to have rules that are effective and are fair so that people will say, I see the reason for that rule. I will comply. But if you make them so unreasonable, people will just say, I'm not complying. It's a stupid rule. <laughs> the regulator has totally missed the ball in many of those categories. So what we do is, as I say, we take the fight to the regulator. We do their job. We do the job for them. And we produce a comprehensive, scientific, peer-reviewed risk assessment of our operations, of our flying activities, all the things we do, what risks are involved in that, how big those risks are. And then once we've done that, once we've done the assessment, we come up with a set of management and mitigation strategies to ensure that the risk is acceptable. And we don't try and eliminate risk. Only an idiot, only a fool tries to eliminate all risk. And a good example of that is 30,000 people die on the roads in the USA every year. It is a huge risk. We could eliminate that risk. We could save 30,000 lives a year if we just said, okay, no more cars on the road. We're gonna, we're gonna ban cars. Nobody would die in a road traffic accident in the USA if that rule was enforced. But of course, it would, no one, we're not doing that. It's a stupid, that would be a stupid rule because the benefits of driving far outweigh the risks. So what we do instead of eliminating the risk is we manage the risk. We say, well, let's introduce some rules to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. And the USA has decided 30,000 deaths a year is acceptable. Um, so they have a rule set that eventually produces that level of carnage. But that's why they have speed limits and other rules that control what you can do on the roads, not to eliminate risk, but to manage it to levels that are acceptable. And that's all we have to do with our drone model aircraft regulations. We don't have to eliminate the risks. We just have to manage them to a level that is acceptable. And the crazy thing is that even before all these extra rules came in, we were already operating to an acceptable level of risk. There still has been no deaths attributed to the recreational use of multi-rotor drones long before we had remote ID being proposed, long before we had the altitude restrictions and the, the no BV loss stuff, still nobody was dying as a result of the recreational use of multi-rotor drones. So the risk, the intrinsic risk to most of our operations are very, very low, which means they don't need a lot of mitigation. 
But regulators don't know that because they haven't done the risk assessment. They've read the Daily Mail and they've read the news reports. Oh, drones are dangerous. We must regulate them so as to eliminate the risk. No, I just said risk elimination is not a clever thing to do. It's the actions of a moron. So, as I say, we now need to do their job for them, present them with the scientifically produced, comprehensive, peer-reviewed risk assessment and our rules, our mitigation strategies that will manage those risks to an acceptable level. And then we go to them, we give it to the politicians, we give it to the papers, we give it to the, to the regulators and say, these are our rules and our justification for these rules. We've seen your rules, show us your justification for your rules. What are they going to do? They don't have any. They don't have a risk assessment. And of course, the politicians probably aren't even aware that this risk assessment doesn't exist. They'll look at our rules and go, well, OK, and they look at the, the, the risk assessment and go, oh, I can see the need for that. I can see that. Then if they go to the, the regulators and say, well, show us your version, the regulators will go, um, oh, no, we've just been guessing. Give us armament. And of course, at the moment, we are reactive. We are reactive. As I said, you know, we get rules thrown at us. New rules get thrown at us and we go, oh, no, terrible, terrible. Um, but we are reacting, we're on the back foot. If we throw this risk assessment at the regulators with our own set of rules, which are designed to protect our freedoms and rights without raising the risk level, then the regulators will be on the back foot. Suddenly, we, are, we have the advantage. We are standing forward, they are leaning back. We have the advantage. That's how you win a battle, by getting your opponent on the back foot and having a m dominance. And we're going to dominate doing this. Trust me, we will dominate. So that's, that's my... First strategy, and it's a positive strategy. We're not knocking, we're not condemning, we're not criticizing. We are saying we can do this better. And here is the proof. Now you prove that your rules are better than ours. We are coming up, we're doing something proactive. We've got to be proactive to safety. We've got to show that we are safety focused and producing a better set of rules, which are more likely to be complied with by those who are affected by them is a great first step. You can have all the rules you like, and if people don't follow them, they are useless. And this is where the second element of civil disobedience, civil disobedience comes in. If we can show the regulators and the politicians and everyone else that we've got a set of rules that people will comply with because it's a good balance of their freedoms, rights and privileges against the responsibilities they must bear as an operator of a model aircraft or a drone, we've got a much greater chance of getting those rules in, in place instead of the crappy ones we've got now. So there we go. That is my first strategy. I don't know what you think. Go down to the comedy but and tell me now I am uh, I'm not a risk um, management specialist I, I'm very much a layman I've, I've done risk analysis I've done management strategies and mitigation strategies I, I understand all the principles and I've done some before but I would really love to hear from someone who does this as a job who's a professional risk analyst someone who this is their, their core activity who's got the, the experience that I don't have they've got the skills and the knowledge that I don't have because we must get this right we must get it perfectly right we can't afford to make mistakes we need to get smarter people than me involved in this so if you're one of those smarter people contact me and we'll work together we'll get as much input as we can from the community we'll check out our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed we'll get it peer reviewed by other groups outside of the hobby to make sure we haven't made mistakes and, and that they agree with our risk assessment and our management strategies and then we can go fully loaded all weapons cocked to the regulators to the politicians to the media and say look we've done the job that the regulator didn't do this is what we should be doing that's what we've got to do take the fight to them what do you think am I wasting my time Am I just sitting here being a conspiracy nut and predicting bad things for no reason at all? Um, I don't know, you tell me. As I say, I'm not always right. I, I always admit that I'm not always right. And you should always look around for alternative perspectives, viewpoints, opinions, information. I'm just one guy. I'm doing the best I can to try and protect this hobby for my grandkids and my grandkids' children and their children going into the future. Uh, I'm not being paid by anybody. I'm, I'm, not be, I'm not responsible to anybody except the hobby. And if you were involved in the hobby, that's you. That's you. I'm doing what I'm doing for you guys. Um, the Harry Day Club will be launching fairly shortly. The t-shirts will be online. I'm not going to make a cent out of those t-shirts. I could say, oh, I'll make $5 a t-shirt and that'd cost more. Um, but no, I think it's more important we have as many people as possible wearing a Harry Day t-shirt. And which means I'm not going to take a cent. They'll be totally at cost. I'll go to Teespring or someone and set them up. You can go and order them and all the money is just to cover the t-shirt. Nothing for me. I'm not making a business out of this. This is not an attempt by me to build an empire or make a lot of money or anything like that. I just want the hobby to survive without it being ground into the dirt by the commercial drone industry and regulators who really haven't done their homework.
that's it. That's it from me. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, as I say, do the commenty bit, spread word of the video. We want as many people involved in this as we can get. We are an army of individuals, which means everybody counts. We can't just rely on a group or a committee or a body. Every one of you has to be involved in this or it doesn't work. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.